Each scale has two ends. Um, the likely to be a seven. The seven is yeah. water. Perfectly neutral. Blood is right around 7.4. The more we go this way, the more it's an acid, the more acidic. The more we go this way, the more it's a base. Now, you've probably heard of things like acid, and you hear people talk about acid dissolving bodies or throwing acid in somebody's face. Well, the, the, the only thing is, acid is just about the number of proteins that are, or no, sorry, number of proteins, number of protons number of hydrogen ions that are in a liquid. The more of these exist, the more acidic it becomes. What is that again? Hydrogen ion. Hydrogen. 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 Oh, hydrogen ion. Hydrogen, and we take an electron away, and all that's left is the proton. Okay. So it's really, we just call that a proton. We just call this a proton. But it's a hydrogen ion, it's lost its electron. So the more of those we have in a liquid, the more acidic something becomes. The less of those we have, the more of this we have, the more base. basic it becomes. Base, like meaning like thick or something? No. Again, it has nothing to do with thickness. It has nothing to do with color. Mm -hmm. It's all about the number of these in the, the liquid. The, yeah, the availability of those in the liquid. Oh, okay. So, yeah, if something is really, really acidic, like uh, stomach acid, which is down around two or four, or even sulfuric acid, which is below that, if that comes in contact with skin, yeah, it's going to be destructive because hydrogen ions by themselves are destructive, and it, it, but more importantly, it's so far from where our normal is. Yeah. But what people don't realize is if you go in this direction, you're going to have the same effect. Something that's very, very basic can be very dangerous to the skin. And if you think of something like bleach, or even more basic, if you think of oven cleaner, you know, like the easy off oven cleaner, they always say, you know, wear thick gloves with this, don't breathe in it, but wear thick gloves. Because if that gets on your skin, it'll cause damage to your skin. Oh, like paint thinners. Like, you know how you remove the paint? Yes. That is very, very acidic. I don't know what that is. I don't know well, if that's, you know, it's not that it's acidic, but it's definitely farther this way or farther this way, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't really care what name we call it. Anything that goes further away from our it's normal dangerous is dangerous, period. No matter, what, no matter what side. Exactly. Okay. The more too extreme, the more dangerous it is. Mm -hmm. And this is a scale. What that means is it's relative to something else. If you look at water, water is acidic compared to our blood. Yes. Because it's more this way. Uh, bleach is more basic compared to our blood, but blood is more acidic compared to bleach. Mm -hmm. So it's a scale. The lower the number versus the higher the number. Is that we always have to refer to something else? Kind of, yeah. Cause, and, and the baseline is water. Oh, the so, baseline. yeah, that's okay. that's sort of our, our starting point. And then if we, if we want to compare it to, like, blood or tissue, then we can say compared to the blood, compared to tissue, compared to human tissue, something like that. Mm -hmm. And again, we do find things in our body that have a very, very low acidity, like stomach acid. That's why it's very dangerous to like your tooth enamel. People who um, constantly throw up, like bulimics, where they Is have, where they purge by throwing up, they actually wear away a lot of their enamel on wow. their teeth from that stomach wow. acid constantly coming up. So this is the basis of the pH scale. I'm not, not going to go into more detail with it, uh, but this is the basis of it. So. Bicarbonate, this is something our cells make in the form of CO2 and then we convert. Then this travels with the blood. When it gets to the lungs, here's what happens. When it gets to the lungs, it goes back to this again. CO2 and water. And then we exhale that CO2. And if we have extra water, we exhale the water too. But what if we don't have extra water? Then do we exhale it? Because no. no, we need it. Because we need it. Which means if our blood is too acidic, would we exhale a lot of the CO2? No. No, because we would need this. So it would stay in this configuration. Yes. Um, we exhale the water in what form? Vapor. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. 
You know this. Go outside tomorrow morning when it's going to be negative 400 degrees. And go, you know, I see my breath. And now I have frostbite. This is going to be really cool. Don't go outside. No, we gotta go outside. We gotta go outside. You want to be here? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. You don't have to, but yeah, I paid. I paid to come here. So I'm not coming. It's gonna be cold. I'm staying in bed. No, you're not. You stay in the bed. You can send everybody a text so we can have paper trail. Wait, what? Uh, if you stay in bed, you can send everybody a text so we can have paper trail. I'm not putting anything in writing. All right, so exactly. your question was really good, in fact, when you asked, do we get rid of all that waste? Because absolutely, there's time where we want to hold on to more of this. If our blood starts to get a little too acidic, we need it to move more this way, then we keep more of this rather than exhaling more of it. So that's a, that's a really good question. Like I said, it's a little advanced, though. That's good. So it's, a, it's very important to understand what it is that blood does. And rather than just thinking of it as that red stuff that comes out when you bleed, uh, think of it as its job that it does. Now, what transports oxygen throughout the blood? No, what transports the oxygen? Red blood cells. Remember, red blood cells, the bus, is carrying all that oxygen. And there are so many red blood cells in our blood that it makes our blood appear what color? Red. Red. There are so many red blood cells in our blood that it makes our blood appear to be red. red um, and why are they called red blood cells? What color are they? They're red. And that's because the hemoglobin molecule, the seats on the bus, are red. And that's because iron is attached to it. Which means blood is red. Now, blood in our veins that has less oxygen is not as red, it's a purplish red, mm -hmm. but it's still red. You said blood is not what? It doesn't have as much oxygen. Yeah, in blood veins. in our veins is a purplish red, but it's still red. Still red. So for all those people who say blood is blue until it's oxygen, no, because there's actually still oxygen in that blood in our veins. They're colored they are colored blonde. Ishihara test. All right, so now we know what blood does. Now, how does blood get pumped around the body? The main pump. What's the main pump? Your heart. Heart. The heart is the main pump. But it is not the only pump because it can't do all the work. So when the blood pumps that oxygenated blood full of all that oxygen out of itself, it has to get pumped around the body. We have to have something that assists. And what is it that assists the blood? The, the heart. Liver. No, now it's the lungs. No. no. Now it assists the blood. Stop saying things. Now it's the arteries. Oh. The arteries are the tubes that carry oxygenated blood around the body. Those are under high pressure. They have elastic walls and they have muscular walls. Which means as the blood comes pumping through, it expands like this. And it has muscular walls, which means it's going to contract and pump that blood forward. Creates a unidirectional flow, a one-way flow. And you can feel that contraction and pumping forward when you feel a pulse. That's what you're feeling when you're feeling a pulse. You're feeling that blood pumping, not just from the heart, but as the arteries expand and then pump it forward. If the arteries lose this ability, that makes the heart have to work harder. And the heart is a muscle. And when you work a muscle harder, what happens to it? It gets bigger. It gets bigger. And this is not good for the heart. This is a time where we don't want a muscle to be bigger because then it becomes less effective. The bigger the heart becomes, the less effective it becomes. Now that's a little bit different in athletes because of the way their heart becomes their size, that size. And um, it maintains an efficiency, uh, in fact, a really good efficiency. But in anybody else who's not a, an athlete, if we have that enlarged heart, that is bad. We don't want that. What that means is we want to make sure our arteries are always working to the best of their ability. Yes? You ever seen John Q? Um, uh, maybe a while ago. 
And I'm his sorry. Son's heart was within enlarged. Washington, it's a true story, but uh, with Denzel Washington and his son, I think his heart was enlarged. <coughs> yeah, his heart was too um too big, and he needed a, a transplant. Because his heart wasn't as effective if it's too big. Okay. Yeah, because it was an F1. Yeah, you play baseball. No, no, it's not why. There, there's, there's a congenital problem. Oh. Because lots of kids play baseball and their hearts don't enlarge. Yeah. Um, because he was a kid, right? He was like yeah, was twelve or ten or something kid. like that. No, I'm talking like people who play college basketball, college football, um, runners all through college, and then even after college, continue to be runners throughout their lives and run marathons. People like that, those personal trainers who work out five times a week and then they teach other aerobic classes and things, those people, okay. not somebody who's played sports for years. His heart was enlarged, for, for, uh, presumably from a, part of, from a congenital defect. Okay. But the idea is the same. Enlarged heart is bad. So he needed a transplant or else he was going to die and then not play baseball with not do anything. He was going to die. Yeah. So what did they have to do? Get him a transplant. Yes. Well, he did. Though. From who? From the girl. Then they did die from an accident. From a who donated their organs? Who was, yeah, who yeah. was a perfect match? Right. So they didn't just they take an her. organ. They killed her. They didn't kill her. <laughs> she was in a car. They didn't just let her die. <laughs> She was an organ donor, and that's an example of how an organ donor can save somebody's life. Yes, they they rushed her they rushed her body in. Of course, because there's no the, there's no blood pumping to her heart if she's dead. Which means what's going to happen to this heart? Six hours, baby. It's, it's please don't. Hold on, but then what? But <laughs> if it's yes. outside of the body, it's still, it's still the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because there's no blood pump to it. Okay. Six hours. Now we can slow that process down a little bit by, by putting it, pumping it yourself. But keeping it cool. And, oh. Well, yeah, if they're keeping blood flowing through it, like keeping our ventilator, well, then it's still getting blood, so that's fine. Mm -hmm. So it's still living tissue. But as soon as that's cut off, that's the top. The stopwatch starts. But if we keep it cold, that's why they put it in the freezer. Then the what's going to happen is the metabolism. And all of those cells in the heart are going to slow down, which means the oxygen that they're using can last longer. Mm -hmm. The glucose, the nutrients that they're using can last longer, which means that six hours could be stretched out a little bit longer. Not a lot, but a little bit longer. But we're still on a clock here. Yeah. Yes. Nothing. Oh, well, it gets it flowing again. Okay, so when when they hook it up to the person, yes. you gotta pump it again. They hook it up to the person and give the little electrical shock. Puts paddles right on it, rather than like on the person's chest, the paddles go right on it mm -hmm. and give it a little electrical shock, and that starts the the, the pacemaker. Because your heart has a pacemaker. My heart has a pacemaker. If I had a heart, mm. <laughs> Victoria's heart. Has a pacemaker. Charney's heart has a pacemaker. Everybody's heart already comes with a pacemaker built in. It spontaneously sends out an electrical signal about every eight tenths of a second. The problem is when somebody's natural pacemaker starts to fail, then what do we do? Artificial. Then we have to give an artificial pacemaker, which is really just a little battery operated box that sends out electrical current. And the wires just go all the way down right to the area of the heart where our natural pacemaker would be. Wow. And the box sits right up here usually under the skin. They got a video on how they did it. Do I? Yeah. Like on YouTube. Probably. And the, the reason why it's implanted underneath the skin here is because if you have to replace that box you can keep the wires in, in their original state and not to go all the way back down to the heart again. You can just go right underneath here. Yeah. I just had to put that in. I thought it could take forever. Looks like they have videos of it. Okay. Oh, we are a little past a break.
where does it transport? Everywhere. 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 And what is the main pump in the body? The heart. 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 The heart. And what assists greatly? Artery. Arteries. 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 So you've heard of arteries, you've heard of veins. So what's the difference? One travels to the um, heart, one carries blood to the heart, one bring it out. That is correct. It is correct that all arteries carry blood away from the heart. Away from the heart. That's the rule. Um, all veins carry blood to the heart. That's the rule. Which means if aliens came down mm -hmm. from another planet again and we dissected their body, we found their alien heart, and we found a tube that carried their alien blood away from their alien heart, we would have to call that tube an artery. That's the rule. So any tube that carries blood away from the heart is an artery. Anyone that carries blood to the heart is a vein. That's the rule. Okay. Arteries are under high pressure. You can feel that in that pulse, all that muscle they have in their wall as the blood comes pumping through. Veins are under low pressure. Which means if you stick a needle in a vein, Blood comes dripping up. It's low pressure. So the artery is high. High pressure. If you cut an artery, blood comes pumping out under pressure, squirting out like in those horror movies. Veins are under low pressure. If you cut a vein, blood comes leaking out. Okay. So all you gotta do for a vein is put pressure on it, and that'll start the clotting process really well. And then it'll stop bleeding, hopefully. Yes? But can you repeat? You said anything that... Carries blood away from the heart is an artery. Oh, anything right. carries blood to the heart is a vein. That's the rule. Thank you. Arteries are very specific. You cannot interrupt an artery. If you interrupt an artery, then some part of the body is not going to get blood. Arteries are like the waitress. She has to bring the food, not just to the table, but to that guy at the table. If anything interrupts that waitress and stops her, he dies. Veins are more like the busboy. After everyone leaves the restaurant, does it make a difference if he cleans that table, then that table, then that table? As long as he cleans and eventually everything goes back to the kitchen. That's what veins are like. That's why you can interrupt a vein. That's why we can cut a vein out of a body. Because the blood will just find another pathway back. But we can't interrupt an artery. If we interrupt an artery, tissue dies. And that's not good. You can't interrupt a vein. But you can interrupt a vein, certainly. You can cut a vein out. The blood will just find another pathway back. Veins also have little valves in them, one-way valves, that allow the blood to flow. If the pressure starts to get too low, they close until the pressure builds up enough that pushes it forward. At any given time, most of the blood in your body is found in your veins because they do have the ability to stretch and hold more blood. Uh, um, you said you said the veins does blood in. Veins carry blood to the heart. They're yes, taking they're, the veins um, are going to be picking up all the waste. Well, the veins are carrying all the waste products, and they're low in oxygen. So we have to go and get oxygen, and we have to get rid of the waste products. But in order to do that, like to get pumped to the lungs, we have to go back to the heart first. Mm -hmm. So the blood goes back to the heart, where it gets pumped over to the lungs and through the lungs. Back to the heart. And now it gets oxygen as it's in the lungs and it gets rid of that waste we breathe out. And then it gets back over to the other side of the heart, where it then gets pumped out through the rest of the body, all now full of oxygen. Uh, yes. So if a vein is interrupted, or let's say a vein collapses, okay. does another vein pick up that function? Yeah, yeah, the blood will just move another way. If there's a if a vein the blood's going this way of a vein and there's something that stops it for whatever reason. The blood just says, all right, well, we'll just go this way. Not a big deal. Because it's just trying to get back to the heart. That's different from the arteries, where it has a specific place to go. 
And if you interrupt that specific direction, then that place right there doesn't get nutrients. And what happens to that place right there? It dies. It dies. Does this make a little bit of sense? So the mm -hmm. artery has to look like that. What is that? No, the artery definitely does. So would they say like the architecture of the abdomen can be like this? Excessive, or the blood to your heart. That's why you're Not from cutting a vein. Veins under low pressure, blood drips out. So no, all you gotta do is put pressure on it, and the clotting factors will start. The platelets will start, and then everything will clot, and then the blood will just find another way back. Eventually, it's hard. No, if someone cuts an artery, then blood comes squirting out. A huge number of arteries, because you understand that first of all, this is our main artery, the aorta. This big one here. Big, huge, thick, A-O-R-A-T-A. A-O-R-A-T-A. The largest artery in the body. But then we have branches off of that. Just like going down 95, and you branch off onto 476. And then you branch off of 476 onto Baltimore Pike. And then you branch off Baltimore Pike onto a main road. And you branch off a main road onto a side street. All these branches get smaller and smaller and smaller. Because remember, they're delivering nutrients to the cells. So the blood has to go to the organ to where it branched off into smaller arteries. So it brings the blood to the tissues. Because remember, tissues are a whole bunch of cells. And then it branches off into smaller arteries where it brings it more towards specific areas of tissue. Then it branched off into the smallest arteries, we call those arterioles, we'll see those later on. And the arterioles then branch off into capillaries. Those are the smallest blood vessels in the body. This is where red blood cells have to go through single file. And they have to squeeze through. Capillaries are tiny. Imagine that. Red blood cells have to squeeze through these capillaries. How small is a red blood cell? Microscopic. Microscopic. So the capillaries are really tight spaces. Some places they're just spaces in between cells. But this is where the oxygen gets off. This is where nutrients get delivered. This is where carbon dioxide gets picked up. And then those capillaries form into small veins called venules. And then those small veins come together to form bigger veins, which then become bigger veins, which then become bigger veins, which eventually become the largest veins in the body, the vena cava. This is the superior vena cava, and this is where the inferior vena cava would go. And all that blood is going to the right side of the heart. Vena cava is the largest vein? Vein. There's two parts to it, V-E-N-A, C-A-V-A. Relax, you're writing too much. Relax, just listen. Learn something. The superior vena cava, Inferior vena cava, there's two parts to it. Could you do mention? The superior vena cava collects the blood basically from the head, shoulders, arm area. And All goes into this vein. And where's the inferior? Ah, oh, okay. And then that collects blood basically from everything below that. Okay. And it all comes back into this <clears throat> side of the heart, the right side of the heart. And you'll notice the heart has one, two, three, four different chambers. So right side and left side. So all that blood that's low in oxygen comes back to the right side of the heart. If it's low in oxygen, where does it need to go to get oxygen? To the lungs. To the lungs. Which means all that blood that's low in oxygen comes to this side of the heart simply to get pumped back out again. To the lungs. Over to the lungs. As it gets pumped to the lungs, through the lungs, it picks up oxygen, gets rid of carbon <sighs> dioxide. And then that blood returns to the left side of the heart, where that blood then gets pumped back out the aorta at just under 200 miles per hour, which then branches off to everywhere in the body and brings that oxygenated blood everywhere. You'll notice the aorta first goes upwards, right? See it going up first? Why would the body say, let's get the oxygenated blood up first? What's up? Your brain. Brain? Most important organ in the body. So the body says, we have all this blood, now it has oxygen in it. Let's go to the most important place first. 
So the aorta first goes up, and you'll notice there's three branches that come up here. This one is going to come up, go over this way, and a big branch will come right up here along the neck, the right carotid artery. And then this branch goes directly up on the left side, the left carotid artery. And they bring that blood to the brain. There's another artery, in fact, that comes up the back way, the vertebral artery. Why, uh, and they bring blood up to the brain. Why does the right artery go, not go straight up? Just the way that it's built. Because we have to send this blood over to the left side. Okay. So this is the first branch, is what we call the brachiocephalic. And then over here, it becomes the, sub, the right subclavian, and here it becomes the right uh, common carotid artery. Okay. This one goes just straight oh, up. I get it. Okay. And then we have a third branch that goes this way that becomes the left subclavian artery. And that blood's going up to the brain. It actually meets at the base of the brain. It's like and a roundabout. the third one off of the aorta goes behind or across the vertebral line. There's one. That's the brachiocephalic, which becomes the sub left sub or right subclavian that uh, goes over this way. And one of the branches comes up as the right common carotid. You yeah. can't see the vertebral artery. Here. Yeah, but I'm saying that's the And then the this third one goes one straight up. Uh, this one goes straight up. This one is just that branch off that. The third one goes this way. Uh, becomes the left subclavian. So we have we want to have two that go this way and two that go up this way. That would be four. Gotcha. But we only have three. So this one splits off and becomes two. Gotcha. These are under high pressure. If those carotid arteries taking blood up to the head get cut, blood is going to come pumping out. Which means blood's not going to go to the brain. So what's going to happen to the person? Brain dead. Yeah, pass out, they're going to die. These, by the way, in blue are the jugular veins. They're taking blood to the heart. You know they're taking blood to the heart because they're called a vein. So the blood is coming from the brain. They've already dropped off nutrients, picked up waste products. Are veins under high pressure or low pressure? Low. Low. Low pressure. So if somebody cuts a jugular vein right here, what's going to happen? It's going to trip. So how are you going to stop it? Pressure. pressure. So they're going to die? No. no. Even though you've heard people say it a thousand times and you get the jugular vein cut, you die. But you don't because it's a vein. It's under low pressure. Because they confuse the jugular vein with the carotid artery. The carotid artery. Oh, they confuse. Yes, because you can't confused. see the carotid artery, but you can feel it. We feel for that for a pulse. But you can see the jugular vein. Boy, especially somebody with high blood pressure, you can see that jugular venous distension bulging out. But it's still not going to cause death if that gets cut. <coughs> so we have this heart, this main pump in our body with these one, two, three, four chambers. Divided into a right side and a left side. Remember, it's always the patient's right or left. The right side is all about deoxygenated blood. Blood low in oxygen, not zero oxygen, low in oxygen. If the blood's low in oxygen, where does it have to go? The lungs. To the lungs. What's in the lungs? Oxygen. How are you going to get the blood to the lungs? Pump it. We're going to pump the blood to the lungs. To the lungs, through the lungs, and back again. And what's the main pump in our body? The heart. When we have blood that is full of oxygen, we want to pump it all around the body. How are we going to pump it? The heart. The heart's the main pump in the body. Well, how can that heart do two different things? It's separated. It's separated. Which means you can almost think of it as two separate pumps that just happen to be right next to each other. Because the blood that comes in this side, slow in oxygen, is going to be a pump right back out again to the lungs. So you can go get oxygen. And then when blood comes in this side that's full of oxygen, it's going to get pumped right back out again to the rest of the body. What is the right side? What's the left side? Left side. Um, right side is the right side. Right side. Dehydrated. Oh, this this is the area. This is concerned with deoxygenated blood. Right side. Blood low in oxygen. Right side. So the left side is going to be oxygenated blood. 
blood full of oxygen. You said the left side is full. Oxygenated. So oh. here's how you'll see me draw it. I'll sometimes draw it looking like this. Here's the left side. Oxygenated. Here's the right side. D. Oxygenated. What does that mean? Low in oxygen. Yeah, low. It's low in oxygen, not zero. Low in oxygen. Um. So you said the left side is what pumps the blood out, and then the right side brings it in. The right side is responsible for pumping blood out, also. Okay. But to the lungs. Only to the lungs. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like yes. You did say that. You had to repeat yourself. Sorry, I just missed that. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes. <laughs> the right side is responsible for pumping blood oh, to the lungs. Blood. But the pressure is enough to pump it to the lungs, through the lungs, and back again to the left side. <laughs> so does it have to be strong to do that? Yes. Yeah, it does. But the left side has to pump the blood out to the whole rest of the body. So does it have to be strong to do that? Yes. Oh my god, yes. In fact, the left side is going to be a little bit stronger than the right side because you got to pump it out to the whole rest of the body. That's a lot. Right side, just the lungs, two lungs, back together. Now you'll notice Has four parts. One, two, three, four. Four chambers. So the blood always comes, when it returns to the heart, when the blood goes to the heart, it always goes to a top chamber. When the blood goes to the heart, it always goes to a top chamber. So the blood going to the right top chamber is low in oxygen, right? Look up here, not down there. The blood going to the top right chamber is low in oxygen, because that's going to the blood. Let's go to the lungs. So all of that blood needs to go to the lungs to get oxygen. So the blood returns from everywhere in the body, goes in this top right chamber. The job of the top right chamber is to collect all that blood and do one thing with it. Pump it straight down. The blood from a top chamber gets pumped straight down. That's it. No, listen. From a top chamber. I don't care. Right, left, middle, back, front. If it's a top chamber, its job is to collect the blood and do one thing with it. Pump it straight down. Not across, not through, not around. Straight down. Top chamber. Top chamber. Okay. I'm guessing the white things in the middle are what pumps it down. Well, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. Okay. Those don't exist. We got it. Erased from my vision. But right now, we don't worry about those. Okay. The chambers. We have this top chamber, this top chamber. The job of the top chamber is to do one thing collect the blood, and their job is to pump it straight down to the chamber below. And remember, this is made of muscle. I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. This is made of muscle. Look how thin the top chambers are. Look how thick the bottom chambers are. A little bit of muscle, huge amounts of muscle. Because the top chambers only have to pump the blood where? Down. Straight down. These chambers have to pump the blood Everywhere up and out. So this one has to pump the blood to, to the lungs, lungs, through the lungs, and with enough pressure to bring it back again. This one has to pump the blood out everywhere. So it's going to have really thick muscles here. So all the blood in the body that's low in oxygen is going to come back to the right side of the heart. The veins do this, right? Because that's what veins do. Take blood to the heart. So all the blood in the body that's low in oxygen has to get oxygen. It's first going to come back to the heart. It's going to go to the right side of the heart. It's going to go into a top chamber, right side of the heart. Then that blood is going to get pumped where? Straight down. 
then that bottom chamber is going to pump the blood right back up and out again. Look up here. It pumps it right up through here. And look at this. Look at this. If you turn this around like this, you see that that actually splits off into two parts. Goes to the left lung, goes to the right lung. Because remember, the heart's like this, right? So blood comes out here into one big tube, and that big tube then splits off into a left and a right big tube. So it's going to take the blood to the lungs, through the lungs, pick up oxygen, and it's going to even be coming back. But the blood comes back this way. Look here, not there. The blood comes back from the left lungs this way. The blood comes back from the right lungs this way. And all that goes into this top chamber right here on the left side. That top chamber collects that blood and does one thing with it. Pumps it. No, oh, the damn. top chamber. Oh, it down. does one thing. It pumps it straight down. Oh, the top chamber, yeah. And then that top chamber pumps it where? Right up through here. It actually goes up this way. You can't quite see it, but it pumps it up through here. See where the pen is? Into this big artery, the largest artery in the body, the aorta, which then delivers the blood everywhere. Now, we do have a problem. The problem is those top chambers pump blood straight down. The big chambers on the bottom pump the blood up and out. Why doesn't the blood go backwards into the top chambers again? Um, there's a valve. There is a valve. There is a one-way valve. That one-way valve does this. Again, look here, not there. That one-way valve does this. It allows the blood to get pumped down and then snaps back shut. Listen. You have to listen for this. Because the blood gets pumped down and then the valve snaps shut. And the pump gets blood, blood gets pumped down and then the valve snaps shut. And the blood gets pumped down and the valve snaps shut. Look, we have two of them, one, two, on either side. Blood gets pumped down, blood gets pumped down at the same time. Both of these chambers fill up with blood at the same time, both of them pump blood down at the same time, which means both of these valves get pushed open at the same time, which means both of these valves snap shut at the same time. Are you listening to this? Mm -hmm. I want you to listen. You're not listening. You need to listen. 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 Because then the blood gets pumped from that bottom chamber up through here. Sounds like there's something in the way. Well, there is. Because as blood gets pumped up through here, it has to go through a valve. Because we don't want the blood to go backwards down into here. So it gets pumped up through that valve, and then as blood tries to go backwards, what happens? The valve snaps shut. The same thing happens with the aorta. As blood gets pumped up through here into the aorta, there's a valve. As blood tries to go backwards, the valve snaps shut. So why do you care? When you are listening to a heartbeat, the sound that you're hearing is not the contraction of the heart. It is not the beat of the heart. The sound you are hearing are the valves closing. So that first sound, we call it the S1 sound, or the lub sound. Lub dub, lub dub. That first sound is the sound of both of these two big valves closing at the same time. The second sound, the dub sound, lub dub, lub dub, is the sound of these two valves closing at the same time. So that's what you're hearing 
when you hear a heartbeat. You're hearing the sound of those valves closing. What would happen if one of those valves was loose? And it didn't close all the way. You would hear it. What would it sound like? Maybe a shh. Wait, let me do it this way. Or you hear a What do we call that? Well, we call it an extra heart sound. That's an extra one. It shouldn't be there. It's a regular heart sound. A beat. It's a regular heart sound. Because we're talking about sounds. That is a murmur. When you hear about people talking about heart murmurs, and before you say, when I, I had a heart murmur, I was diagnosed when I was younger with heart murmurs, I know you're going to say it. I know you are. I know. I know you had a heart murmur when you were younger. That's, that's why not you, not you, not you, not you, but somebody in here had one. And their pediatrician told the parents, your pediatrician told your parents, I hear a heart murmur. And your parents went, and the pediatrician said, Oh, let's keep an eye on it. What do you mean we'll keep an eye on it? This is the heart. Well, what are kids doing when they're first born? Growing. Growing. Does that mean they're growing taller? No. Kids aren't growing taller when they're first born? Well, longer? Yes. Of course they are. Is their brain still growing? Yes. Is their liver still growing? Yes. Is their heart still growing? Yes. Which means... There are still some things that could grow into place, and maybe they just haven't yet. Which is why that pediatrician said, yeah, keep an eye on it. Kind of nonchalantly, willy-nilly, make it sound like he's not caring. No, he just knows that it's you know, very common for a young child to have a little bit of a murmur because their heart's still growing, which means everything's still growing into its place. Not point? uncommon at all. Now, if a person didn't have a heart murmur, and then suddenly at 48 years old was diagnosed with a heart murmur, now that's a concern, because that's new, that's changed, which means that valve that used to be doing this is now doing something like this. Yeah. The valve that should be doing this and closing Does that mean that blood will flow through there now? Hmm? Does that mean that blood will flow? Through? It'll flow backwards. Backwards sometimes. Yeah, we don't want that. Yeah, that's what I was just. I was just confirming if that's what would happen since it's not closing all the way. Yeah, we don't want that at all. If we put more blood in that chamber, now there's more volume. If there's more volume, now the heart has to work harder to pump it out. If the heart works harder, what's going to happen to the heart? It's going to enlarge. And what happens when the heart enlarges? Is that good or bad? Yeah, right. That's bad. It becomes less effective. So that could cause a problem. We don't want that. And remember, this is a circulatory system. Circulatory. Which means we do not want things going backwards at all. But if there's a problem somewhere, things should back up. Which is going to cause problems in the preceding areas. Does that make some sense? A little bit of sense? Half a cent? Fifty cent? Mm -hmm. What's blood made up of? Um, red blood cells. Oh, it's definitely red blood cells. Two main things. Blood is made up of two main things. A liquid component that makes up about 55% of blood is the liquid part. And then a solid component. We call those formed elements, because that sounds fancy. So we can charge more. It just means solid particles to me. Solid particles in a liquid. Haven't we heard that somewhere before? Yeah. Osmosis, the passive movement of water across the cyclic kernel membrane by air, low solid particles. Lost it somewhere there. Formed elements. So that makes up about 45% of blood. That's going to include red blood cells. That's going to include white blood cells. That's even going to include the platelets. <coughs> the fragments of cells. Platelet is a fragment of the cell. It's like a complete cell. It's a fragment. It's going to tore it off. Throw it in the blood. Take a mega 
carrier site tear it up for the pieces of the blood we call those platelets. So blood's made up of liquid, 55%, formed elements, 45%. Of the liquid, oh, see I lost my movie. Of the liquid, about 92% of that is water. About 92% of the liquid portion is water. They call that liquid portion plasma. Which means almost half of your blood is made up of water. Which is why we can see those changes in blood pressure with regard to increasing the amount of water that's in the blood or decreasing the amount of water that's in the blood. If somebody's dehydrated, is their blood pressure going to be higher or lower? No. Lower. Somebody eats a lot of salt, puts a lot of salt in their blood, that brings a lot of water into the blood. Because remember, water follows salt. Is that going to make their blood pressure higher or lower? Uh, higher. We increase the volume of water, we increase the pressure. So if somebody has high blood pressure, first thing we're going to do is say, get rid of some of that water. What's the body's best way of getting rid of a bunch of water? Yeah. Peeing. So we're going to give them medication that's going to cause them to pee out a lot of that water. Or if they can pee out a lot of that water, that's going to lower their pressure. What's that pill called? Diarrhea. The water pill. Yes, although they should call it the make you pee pill. <laughs> it's a diuretic. That pill is called hydrochlorothiazide, or HCTZ, the make you pee pill, because that's what it does. And if you get rid of a whole lot of water real fast, that's going to get rid of a whole lot of water in the blood. It's going to get the blood pressure lower real fast. It's a good thing. So this is one of the first things we give people with high blood pressure, something very, very benign. In other words, meaning it doesn't have a lot of side effects. Um, patients might lose some potassium, so we might give them some potassium supplements along with it. But otherwise, it's fairly benign. Yes? Even if I take the potassium, you also eat things like these bananas or something like that? Eat any foods on potassium, but yeah, banana is the one that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I prefer mine sort of split down the middle with ice cream, hot <laughs> sauce, and caramel, strawberries, whipped cream, a little more whipped cream. A little more whipped cream. Some chopped nuts, a little more whipped cream. That's the best way to eat it. In case you couldn't tell. <laughs> what? You eat junk food? Say it ain't so. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to get too much potassium? Yes. That's not good. But it has to be a lot of potassium all at once. In fact, Potassium is very, very important for our cell membranes, all of our cell membranes. All of our cell membranes have a, a mechanism that exchanges sodium and potassium to regulate the amount of each within or outside of the cell, which of course is going to change cell membranes, which will of course change the inside of the cell, which will of course cause something to happen, not happen. So having that ability to exchange those particles is important. But if you put too much of the potassium on one side, then it's not going to allow for that exchange, which means the cell's going to stop doing what it's doing, which is why uh, the potassium, is it potassium chloride, is that what it is? Is one of the, is this the injection that's given, the lethal injections? One that kills the patient, stops the heart, can't reset the membranes. Can't reset the membranes, they don't depolarize, they don't depolarize, they don't contract, they don't contract, heart doesn't contract, heart doesn't contract, Blood doesn't get pumped. Blood doesn't get pumped. Kaput machen. Das ist nicht so gut. That's what I was wondering if I was So, yeah. But it'll be in that form. As compared to like, somebody simply eating a box of bananas. Yeah, I mean, you can see it on EKG, it'll show up. Um, 
cause a change there at last. You know what an EKG looks like as a little peak and then a big giant peak and then a bigger peak here. Those show a change in that, that last little peak. So it can affect the heart, but it's, most people don't suffer from uh, excessive potassium. Most of the times, either due to medications, uh, either causing them to lose too much potassium or store too much. But that's usually a problem in an average normal person. Okay, so we've gotten nowhere on these slides, but that was kind of the idea. I want to give you sort of an overview of what the cardiovascular system does. And of course, there's much more detail than this, and that's what we're going to get into as soon as I find whether that's in front of me. So understand again, now we're going to be talking terminology, just terminology. We're not going to get a whole lot more anatomy or physiology, just terminology, some basic information. Ready? Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. A heart. Where is the heart located? In the thoracic cavity. The thoracic cavity left is centered. centrally located, but it's kicked over to the left. It is actually more toward the center of your chest than people realize. But it is kicked over to the left. So if you were if you want to find the apex of your heart, which is this right here, this right here is the apex of your heart. If you want to locate the apex of your heart, you go to your left clavicle. Then you find this midpoint of your left clavicle. And you go down just beneath the fifth rib, which on then would be right here. We call that the left midclavicular line. And right there you find the apex of the heart. This is going to become important for you, ladies, later on when you're learning to put EKG leads on the heart. Because you have to put them in certain areas. So you have to be able to locate these different landmarks. This is the apex, the tip. The heart is about the size of your fist on average. About the size of your fist. Protected by the bones of the sternum and the ribs. Okay, what does CPR stand for? Computerized patient record. That as well. So how do you know which one they're asking for? You gotta use common sense. You have to use a little common sense. If somebody says, oh my god, he's dying, does anybody know CPR? You don't run up and go, I know computerized patient records, everything that we buy. Give me his first name. <laughs> so in this case, of course, we're talking about cardiopulmonary resuscitation. When we're doing CPR, we're doing those chest compressions. When we do CPR, what are we trying to save? The heart, the brain. The brain. The brain. The brain. The heart and the brain. No, we don't care about the heart. The brain. I think we do. Heart lasts six hours. We only care about the brain. Because that, if that brain isn't getting any blood from the heart, because the heart stopped beating, if that brain isn't getting any blood, the brain's going to die. How long is that going to take until we see irreversible cell death in the brain? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. If the heart isn't getting any blood because it's stopped pumping, how long do we see irreversible cell death in the heart? Six hours. Six hours. You got plenty of time. Not worried about the heart. Definitely 20 minutes, we're worried about the brain. So when we're doing those chest compressions, all we're trying to do is do what the heart is not doing, which is pump the blood up to the brain. This is why I say don't worry about doing breaths into the patient's mouth. It's a waste of time. Doing those chest compressions is plenty. It's all you need to do. Just do chest compressions. There's plenty of oxygen still in his blood or her blood. Taking the time out to stop and give breaths is a waste of time. And also it drops the blood pressure down. Uh, CVT is what? Cardiovascular technician? Yes, not terribly important. What's an ECG? Electrocardiogram. Electrocardiogram. 
What is an EKG? Wait, what? I thought this one was electrocardiogram. They mean the same. Is it gram or gram? They're both gram. If you're talking about taking a recording, it's a gram. If you're talking about the recording itself, it's a gram. Like the piece of paper you're looking at, it's an electrocardiogram. So what's the difference between ECG and EKG? Actually, nothing other than the K. The K stands for what? What does the C stand for? Cardio. Which means? K stands for cardio. Cardio means what? Heart. Heart. The K stands for cardio. <laughs> <laughs> The K stands for cardio, yeah. which means heart. Heart. heart in German. Because the guy who created this was German. So for him, an electrocardiogram was an electrocardiogram with a K, which is why you'll still hear me today call it an EKG, because that's how I learned it all my life, as an EKG. And then somebody finally said, uh, we're not speaking German. We won that war. We're not speaking German. So it is not EKG, it's ECG. Which, yeah, makes sense. Oh, but I still call it an EKG. What did you say CVT meant? Cardiovascular technician. What is an SOB? Do not put me <laughs> Yeah, I had it. <laughs> Shortness of breath. Shortness of breath. Cardiovascular what? Tech. Tech. CVT, cardiovascular. Okay, what do you think these stand for? What, is, what do you think cardi? Heart. heart I'm going I'm to put the vowels in if you don't mind. Cardio means heart. heart. What do you think electro means? Electric. 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 What do you think pulmonary means? Lung. Lung or air. What do you think thoraco means? Thoracic. Thoracic chest. Yeah, fair enough. That's true. So. What is the definition of, okay, first of all, I want, I want you to realize something here. Notice this is endocardium, myocardium, epicardium, pericardium. This ending is the noun. So it's the thing. It's not, a, it's not an adjective. It's not describing. It's the thing. So this is the thing that does what? You said the M. The U -M. This is the noun. So... What is this the thing? What the what is this thing doing? Endo. What is endo? Within. Within. What is cardio? Heart. Within the heart. So this is the thing within the heart. Within the heart. What about myocardio? The thing. The heart muscle. The heart muscles. The muscle of the heart. Epicardium. Above. Above. Peri. Around. Some of this sound familiar? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Endocardium, we just talked about that briefly. This is uh, aligning within the heart, which we'll talk about later on. The adjective form of endocardium is endocardial. Oh, they did all the moments. Okay. Uh, endocardium, the adjective form is endocardial, which AL means what? Pertaining to. Pertaining to. So it's pertaining to in the heart. Fibrosis is. Like scar tissue. Fibrosis is like scar tissue, becoming scar like. So, by fibrotic is pertaining to. We'll hear a little bit more about fibrosis later on. This one is incredibly important ischemia. Ischemia is incredibly important. Ischemia is a restriction in blood flow. Ischemia. That's bad. Why? Because if blood is not flowing here to this person, that waitress is not bringing food to that person. What's going to happen to that person? Uh, They're going to die. 
So if we have something that's restricting the blood flow to an area, what's going to happen to those cells? They're going to slow down. They're going to slow down. They're going to stop working. They're going to die. And once they're dead, they can't do their job at all. Necrosis is what? Like dead tissue. Dead tissue. So necrotic is a pertaining to dead tissue. And then finally, pericardium peri means around. It's around the heart. So pericardial pertaining to around the heart. I think that takes us to a break. Yes. 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 The atrium is the name of the top chamber. So we have a right atrium and we have a left atrium. Plural is atria. Just like singular bacterium, plural bacteria. Singular atrium, plural atria. So we have a right atrium and a left atrium. Which one of those deals with the oxygenated blood? Right atrium. Right atrium. Remember, it's always the right side, the oxygenated. Then there's two big chambers on the bottom. Those big chambers are called the ventricles. There is a right ventricle and a left ventricle. You said the chamber at the bottom? Yes. And the plural for ventricle is simply ventricles. <laughs> ventricles. Plural. What's a septum? Separates the chambers. It's a wall. What's a plural for septum? Septum. That one you remember. Okay. Now let me show you this one really quickly. I told you that the blood goes from a top chamber. From a top chamber, where does the blood go? Down. Only goes straight down. That's it. That's the only option. Blood from the top chamber only goes straight down. And then those bottom chambers pump the blood up and out. What we don't want to do is we don't want blood to go backwards in any of this. So we have to have something that's going to stop blood from going from this bottom chamber back up into that top chamber. And on the right side... We have a valve that has three parts to it, three cusps, three cusps, or leaflets. So on the right side here between the top and bottom chamber, that is called the tricuspid. It has three leaflets. On the right side, this is the valve between the top right and the bottom right chamber. It has three cusps, or leaflets, that allows the blood to flow through and then snap shut. On the left side, hold on, on the left side, because it's going to make sense in a moment, because you're looking up here and you're like, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Listen, shut up, look. On the left side, there's also a valve. That valve has two cusps. That is called the bicuspid but it is also known as the mitral valve. You do need to know both names, because you'll hear both. But remember I told you about an hour or so ago that this class is about the terminology, not about the anatomy so much. We'll go over this more in anatomy, so don't freak out if you're not totally understanding it yet. Bicuspid has two leaflets, two cusps. On the right side, the valve between the top and bottom chambers, the tricuspid valve. Yes. There's a reason for that. For everything being left? There's a reason why the one on the left side only has two cusps and the one on the right side has three cusps. Which ventricle? Right or left? Which ventricle is stronger? The left. The left. Which means which ventricle is more likely to force blood backwards? The left. 
the left. So imagine if you have a pizza. The more slices you cut it in, did you just say, mm, the more slices you <laughs> cut it in, each slice becomes thinner, yes. which means it becomes weaker. Mm -hmm. So less this cuts. side, less cuts, stronger. So by having only two cusps, it adds extra strength, so the blood doesn't go backwards. Makes a little bit of sense? Yes. Now there are two other valves I talked about. One is here, and one is here. Because of course, we have this purple pulmonary trunk that comes out and brings the blood over to the lungs. And we have that aorta that comes out and brings blood everywhere else. So we have these semi-lunar valves here as well. But we'll see those later on. Pulmonary valve, aortic valve. Which is pretty easy, actually. But again, it's easy once you understand the other stuff first. And once you understand the other stuff first, then it's like, okay, well, that makes sense called the aortic valve. It's right there at the beginning of the aorta. But don't worry about it yet. Relax. You guys take this too seriously. What does interatrial mean? What is inter? In. Or between. between. AL is pertaining to. So if we had a wall that was right between these two top chambers, what would we call that wall? Interatrial. Interatrial. Wall. What would we call wall? Septum. septum. So that would be the interatrial septum. And if we had a wall that separated these two bottom chambers, what would we call that? Interventricular. Interventricular septum. Because it's the wall between the two ventricles. Do you see that? Do you see that? Interventricular septum is the wall between the two ventricles. Just look up here. AL is pertaining to, enter means between ventricular ventricles. So the wall in between the septum? The septum is the wall. Mm -hmm. So the interventricular septum is the wall. The septum is the wall between the two ventricles. Okay. And it's important to have a wall here between these. Because remember, the whole right side of the blood, is that full of oxygen or low in oxygen? No. Left side no. of the heart, full of oxygen or low in oxygen? No. Do you want them to mix? It's full. Do you want them to mix? No. no. You don't want them to mix. So you have to have a wall in between here. Because, because we don't want blood from that's low in oxygen mixing with blood that's full of oxygen. Because then when that helps pumped out to the body, the body's going to get less oxygenated blood. Could there be a hole here? Yeah. Yeah, you ever hear a child go a hole in their heart? Yeah. Could there be a hole here? Yes. Yeah. Anywhere where the. Um, Anywhere there's a sense. wall, it's possible to have a hole. Hmm. A wall is meant to separate things. So if a hole, that means there's going to be some interaction between the two sides. So if we put a hole right over here in this wall, we could look over and go, hi, Kate. She'd go over and say, stop watching. Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't. We'd still bother it. Something's going to blow your mind later on. Every one of us started out with a hole in our heart. It was supposed to be there. Yeah. And do it's time it close. Oh, before born. birth? When you're born. Okay. It closes immediately? Mm -hmm. Air? Is it something that has to do Since we breathe this, yeah, the vacuum is created, that hole closes right up. Oh, okay. Because we don't breathe when we're in the uterus. No. There's no oxygen in the uterus. Really? So that hole yeah. allows. So there's oxygen coming through the, yeah. the umbilical cord. All that stuff comes from the baby now. But no, it comes from the blood. The mother's blood brings oxygen to mom's uterus. Just like right now, everyone in here who has a uterus has blood going to their uterus right now. Yes. If there's a baby in the uterus, then the baby takes the oxygen. Okay. So the baby has its own separate blood that it sends to the uterus and then takes the oxygen and brings it back to itself. Okay. It's stealing the oxygen. Yes. So technically there is oxygen though. But it's not breathing. Okay. Okay. <sighs> it's not doing that. So the blood's coming right back into the baby 
And then that blood goes right into the vena cava, which then goes right to the right side of the heart. So if it goes to the right side of the heart, the right side of the heart is supposed to be free deoxygenated blood. Their blood's already full of oxygen. So it doesn't have to go to the lungs. So the hole in the top chamber allows the blood to go from the right side of the way to the left side. And there's another connection right here. You can even see the remnant of it on this model. This white right thing. Another connection. Any blood that does get pumped up through here in that baby, and it just goes right in here anyway. It's shunted over. And then that closes up. It's called the ductus arteriosus. As soon as we start breathing, and then it heals over. So if we were to dissect your heart out right now, which we're not going to do, because there are some laws or something. But if we were to dissect out your heart, we could look right there in that wall. We'd be able to see a little indentation that we got there used to be. And we'd be able to see a little um, ligamentous arteriosus right here where that connection used to be. Semilunar, it just means the shape, sort of moon, half moon-like. Those are the valves, the other ones we'll talk about later on. Uh, AV, we just talked about those. O2 stands for what? Oxygen. Technically, it stands for molecular oxygen. Because it's a molecule of oxygen. Yeah. It's an atom of oxygen connected to another atom of oxygen. When you get two atoms connected, we call that a molecule. So this is a molecule of oxygen. So technically, this is molecular oxygen. You know what everybody calls it? Oxygen. Oxygen. Which is fine. So, cool. Cool. Then this is what? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, which is the one that comes from exhausts of cars. Or Carbon monoxide. 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 One O. It's just C O. What? Do, which ones the trees like? Carbon dioxide. Which ones do they give us? Oxygen. O two. Wait. Molecular oxygen. Which one do we like? Molecular oxygen. Which one do we give trees? Carbon dioxide. It's a perfect environment. I mean, we just live in perfectly perfect together. Oxygen. This is why they say plant a tree. Because if you plant a tree, it's going to make more oxygen. It's going to take our carbon dioxide from us. Have you ever wondered? Have you ever wondered <coughs> why Brontosaurus was such a big dinosaur? Um, it ate plants. Plant eater. Herbivores. So it grew big. But wouldn't they have to eat a lot of plants? Yeah. But were the plants bigger then? Yeah. Were the leaves bigger then? Yeah. Why? More oxygen. No. Because oh. the environment actually had more carbon dioxide. Oh, right. The environment during like the Jurassic period had more carbon oh, dioxide, course. which means the plants thrived. Yeah. So they could grow huge. But then, of course, the animals could thrive. They could grow huge and eat those big leaves. 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 What's the biggest animal to have ever lived on the planet Earth? Um, uh, an elephant. A whale. Oh, yeah, the, 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 the white whale. Or the killer Blue whale. Blue whale. Blue whale. Really? Still, yeah. bigger than any dinosaur that ever lived, the blue whale is still the biggest animal that ever lived on the planet. Oh, so what what <laughs> can kill a whale? <laughs> Not much. A T-Rex. <laughs> a shark? 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 Okay. But there's, a blue whale is pretty big. A shark could have to be pretty... Or, or, it's or it's more like pretty, small, pretty, listen up, buddies, we're going to go feast. Yeah, you have to have a lot of friends. Cover um, an animal. Okay, what about, what's smaller than a shark that you kill a blue whale? Dolphin. Dolphin or something. Um, what? Dude, I saw one say, I'm pretty big. I'm a duck shark, right? You kill a shark? Yeah, you kill a shark. The answer I understand is microorganisms. Something small here. A parasite. A parasite. Oh, parasite. What about smaller than parasite? What's smaller than a parasite? Bacterium. What's more than a bacterium? Virus. Virus. Yeah, that's why I heard virus. A virus can kill a blue whale just like a virus can kill us. What type of virus is I don't know. I'm not a marine biologist, although I play one on TV. <laughs> um, but imagine that. Something as small as a virus. One of the smallest things that we know, which isn't even a thing, it's not a living thing, it's not a non living thing, could kill the largest animal on the planet. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have to see. 
No one's sick. <laughs> Just little fun facts. Yeah, I watch National Geo Breakfast, no problem. It's nothing. I watched a whole two hour scene with about turkey. You learn from it? No. Oh, I was Jesus. on the phone. It was a little date. Justin, Justin <laughs> July, fun fact. Um, <laughs> Icelandic whalers reportedly kill a rare blue whale just this July. Say that again? This past July, Icelandic whalers reportedly killed a rare blue whale. Icelandic whalers. Or a rare I don't know either. I guess some, they like bird watchers, but for whales. <laughs> some um, countries uh, and some cultures are allowed to kill a certain number of whales because that's just the way they've always survived. I don't know. But they're kind of protected. That's what yeah. we do. It was a rare one. So I don't think that was allowed. Almost like 1,000 BC. When they try to kill a, um, every certain season, they kill a wood fan. What am I reading? Do they hate it? Then they don't just try to, they don't really try to kill a lot of them. They just focus on one. Because they know that one will allow them to survive for a whole year until they get another bundle of wood fan. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. like it's heavy. <laughs> And also, the first person that kills that boat, yeah. There you go. Okay. Systole and diastole. These terms are pronounced systole and diastole. Well, we know what dia means. And what else? Sis Stoli Dias Stoli. That's how those words are pronounced. Not systole and diastole. That is an incorrect pronunciation. The correct pronunciation is systole and diastole. Systole, systole and diastole. Oh, Systole, that's not I, I did, yes. So you can take one of the S's Take an S and put a star. Don't do that. Come on now. <laughs> one professionalism point off for Dr. Sturdy. <laughs> Thank you. It's the context. It is not a vulgar word if it's not used in a vulgar context, exactly. and it is not. That's what he said. Die ass, asterisk, stole <laughs> So you'll hear people mispronounce these all the time. They will say systole and diastole. Just don't even bother. We've given up. We don't even try to convert people anymore. If that's the way you want to pronounce it, that's fine. Now, what does this mean? Systole. Systole. Mark comes down. Is yeah. blood pressure during contractions. Contraction. Diastole during relaxation. Measure blood pressure during relaxation. Relax. Oops. So we talk about systolic blood pressure, that's the pressure during contraction of the heart, or contraction of the vessels even. Diastolic pressure of the blood during the relaxation process. Hmm. So, when we measure this, we measure this as systolic over diastolic in millimeters mercury. of mercury, MMHG. We measure it as systolic pressure over diastolic pressure in millimeters of mercury. 
And what instrument do we use to do that? With Sphygmomanometer. That? Sphygmomanometer. Blood pressure cuff. Blood pressure cuff is correct. Blood pressure cuff. Sphygmomanometer. Sphygmo. Manometer. Sphygmo. Manometer. 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 Sphygmo manometer. That, that's going to be on the final exam. You have to pronounce it correctly. While, while holding a bunch of sour fleas. Sour. It would have been funnier if I had sunflower seeds in your mouth. Sphygmo manometer. Okay. I want to explain something to you. When you learn to take blood, you take it from a vein. After you've located that vein, right there, what do you do next? You check the pulse. Put a tourniquet right above it. That rubber band tourniquet. What does that rubber band tourniquet do? It brings the pressure. Increase the flow in which direction? Down. Yeah. To my hand or to my heart? To your hand. Yeah. No. That little rubber band, blood's going to pump right past that. But then the blood's going to try to return to my heart. Oh, but it's in your heart. But that, remember, veins are under low pressure. So that little rubber band tourniquet, that's not going to stop the blood flow going out of your hand. It's going to pump right past it. But as the blood tries to return, now it gets backed up. Because remember, veins are under low pressure. So now that vein is going to fill up with blood, which makes a nice big target for you. And you stick it. And you drain that blood out of that person. Which means as soon as you've got the needle in the blood, <coughs> if you've got another collecting one tube of blood, you can take that turning drop. If you're collecting two tubes, oh, you wait, you take one tube off with another tube on. Once you get the other tube started, you take that turn for it. But that's the idea. The idea is to stop the blood flowing back to the heart. Does that make sense? Yes. So how about with a sphygmomanometer? We put that on a person's arm, and what do we do? Pump the pressure. We pump that pressure up. We want to stop the blood. From going here down to here. We actually want to stop the blood from traveling from here to here. We want to stop that artery from pumping the blood from here to here. So we pump it up and pump it up and pump it up and pump it up with all that pressure and pump it up and pump it up and pump it up with all that pressure and pump it up and pump it and pump it with all that pressure. Then we get our stethoscope and we put it right here and we listen. There's no blood flow through that artery right now. Then we start to let the, pen, the pressure out. Release that pressure a little bit. You'll watch that needle start to fall. No blood coming through yet. No blood coming through yet. As soon as that blood comes through, rushes past that po point, you'll see a little tiny bump mm -hmm. as it's falling. And you'll hear just that first little, little, you hear, wherever that needle is, that's your top number, systolic pressure. And then you keep listening. So as you're listening, that last that you heard, wherever that needle was, that's your diastolic pressure. I heard it. Uh, I thought that the first, the systolic number was the thump. The, the thump first, sound. the first one. Yeah. Because you hear dun 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 dun. -dun, -dun. <laughs> that first one you hear is the systolic number, but then the needle's still falling, yeah, pressure's still, still coming out, and you still hear dun dun dun, but it gets quieter. The last that you hear 
This is the diastole. That's why I always say, I thought we were supposed to hear like another thump. That's why I'm saying, oh, I didn't get the bottom number. There's two of them. Yeah, I thought I was supposed to hear like the first boom. Like, yeah, it's not like a secondary boom. Yeah, that's no. how I was thinking. Well, I understand. Yeah, no, you're supposed to hear that that last. You don't hear it. And that last you hear is the bottom number. Oh, okay. There's actually five Karolikov sounds that you hear. Yeah. But we only listen to the first two. That's the only ones you're going to be listening to. That's the only one we listen to, really. Because I can't hear it over my stethoscope. So those are the only two you hear. The first one, the last one. This is a skill, ladies. It's a skill. So in order to get good at taking blood pressure, what do you have to do? Practice. Practice. And the good news is you can practice at home. I know I do my mom. You can, you can practice with family members, friends, um, strangers if you ask permission. Don't just run up on people. <laughs> Drop that on her. <laughs> Dr. Like Spurgeon told me to do this. You whipping it on your arm. It takes practice. Yes. And it takes a good stethoscope. Yes, it does. Invest in a good stethoscope. Are we allowed to get like any stethoscope? Like, are we allowed to get one that like fits our style? Yeah. Okay. Like color wise. Sure. All right. Just make sure. Any does it have stethoscope. To be the one that I a litman. I would recommend it because that is the gold standard of stethoscopes. Oh, Litman? Litman. Yeah. I have. It's all right. I have a Litman and I have a knockoff Litman, Litman. which was like forty dollars, which still works well, but it's not going to hold up as well. That's the one I keep in my car, and then my Litman I keep with me. My dad got me one for Christmas, and it just came in like two weeks ago. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, I don't think I can use this. You, you can. I can hear out of it. Is it Lippman? No. Lippman's the best one. Yeah, I was going to get one for graduation. Yeah. But he, he got me this one for Christmas. I can hear out of it. Like, I can hear my own heartbeat and it's loud, but I don't, it just, I don't know. It just looks weird. I'm going to bring it in tomorrow. Bring it in tomorrow. I'll see how weird it is. But it is a good idea for birthday gifts, Valentine's gifts, birth, um, Christmas, Hanukkah, uh, it's not Secretary's week, whatever. <laughs> if you have somebody get you a gift, hundred bucks. It's on hundred bucks minimum actually. Yeah, that's more like hundred to hundred fifty. Like there's there's a couple more. Some of the advanced cardio apps, cardio threes. Yeah, or, yeah but um, okay. I definitely suggest investing in one because one, it's going to make learning a lot more a lot easier. Because otherwise, you're going to be struggling with this one. It's going to be a lot more comfortable, and you're going to need one anyway. And if you invest in a good one, you'll have it for years, decades even, hmm. as long as nobody steals it. Hmm. What are you talking about? Uh, uh, Stats, this out. Okay. Stethoscope, we know what stethoscope. We now understand what a murmur is a little bit, right? Yeah. A little bit. Okay. We describe murmurs as to. Um, like what they sound like, how loud they are, and even like when, like when they happen. Okay, here's an ECG or an EKG. What we're actually seeing here, I want you to notice this. You're not seeing contractions of the heart. This is not the heart contracting. And you can tell it's not the heart contracting, but look, because look at the measurements. Time, millivolts. This is showing the electrical activity of the heart. Mm. Well, yeah, this is electrical. Yeah. Electrical. Do you remember we talked about muscle before? Yes. Do you do you remember that in order for a muscle to contract, it has to be told to contract? Yes. Do you remember that that nerve sends a signal down as an electrical current? Yes. That then changes to, to a chemical, chemical message? Back to electrical current. Back to electrical current. And this muscle is different. Cardiac muscle reacts directly to electrical current. It doesn't have that intermediate. It doesn't require that extra acetylcholine. It just goes electrical right to the muscle. So what we're seeing here is that change across the membrane. Where, where we said before it goes electrical to chemical to electrical inside the muscle. Here we're seeing electrical to electrical inside the muscle directly. This is what this is measuring the changes of the electrical current inside of the muscle cells. Now, why are there 
three main bumps. Bump one, bump two, bump three. Uh, the first one is actually representing the pacemaker that we all have that suddenly releases this electrical current. Did they all have a P? No. I don't know why they started with P, but they did. I don't know why. Is it the alphabet? Well, it goes in order yeah. from there, but yeah. I don't know why it started with P, but yes. It also represents those two, two top chambers, the atria, because they get the signal from that pacemaker at the same time. The signal comes from the pacemaker, which is located in the top back part of the right atrium, and sends it to both the atria at the same time. So this represents not only that pacemaker, and again, I'm going to go over this again, so relax. It also represents the electrical current in both the top chambers at the same time. Then the chambers contract. You can't see that on here. In fact, it happens somewhere in here. So you can't actually see it contract. Then the signal goes down that wall, splits off, gets to the apex of the heart, the tip of the heart, and comes up both ventricles. Which means both the ventricles actually get the signal to contract from the bottom first. But that kind of makes sense. If they're full of blood, and we want that blood to come out the top, well then the contraction should start at the bottom so that it looks like this. Because that's going to push the blood up and out. So the ventricles contract like this, pumping the blood up and out. The atria contract like this, pumping the blood straight down, from the top and down they contract. So the ventricles, remember, are thick. Lots of muscle means lots of cells, which means lots of electrical current, which is why you see this giant deflection up here. Then all those cells have to reset, go back to the original electrical state they were in. The resetting is what we see in that final one. We call that repolarization in the T wave. It just goes back to the way that it was before. The process of resetting all those charges causes this peak here. The T wave. This is basically the completion right, this, of I all see? the electrical current. Yeah, like this, the, the, it, the steps it goes through yes. throughout the heart. Yes. And then stops right there yes. to do it over again. Which means stopping here, stopping, he here. stopping here is going to be starting back over here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then we see another B wave, and then QRS and then T. We call this the QRS complex because. It goes, uh, well, QR. <laughs> so we'll see that again. I'll go over it again, but I'll also go over the chambers again. The SA node, the um, a pacemaker again. I'll go over the electrical current pathways again. So right now I just kind of want you to hear it. So can we oh, talked about some of these already. Atrial and ventricular, you understand the difference? Yep. Top chambers, bottom chambers? Yep. What does bradycardia? Slow heart. Beat. What is tachycardia? Fast heart beat. So what if somebody was a tachy SOB? <laughs> they would have bradycardia. Fast If they were a tachy SOB, they'd have a fast heart rate and shortness of breath. Also, they would tachycardia. I only bring this up because it, had been, it has happened before in emergency rooms where a nurse was talking to the, the doctor about the patient behind the curtain, and the family members were right there listening, and the nurse said the patient's a tacky SOB, and the family members got upset because they didn't realize <laughs> tacky SOB meant tachycardic and shortness of breath. They thought they were insulting the patient. Well, no. Nothing happened before. It's their fault. They don't know. Yeah, but we mind, business. mind your own business. Exactly. Yeah, I was talking about me. Shut up. No, I was talking about your friend. <laughs> she my business too. Yeah. So, um, here's something. A sinus rhythm is actually a normal rhythm. When you hear the word sinus, this is normal. In this case, not sinus like a, a sinus space in a bone. Yeah, sinus and like a, in, in here. There's spaces. I don't know if you know this. There's actually spaces, all those spaces here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. 
I mean, there's a little thin mucus lining, but otherwise it's hollow. It's almost like this movie I watched. When this man, his face was black, but he can still breathe out of like these particles of his nose, they were open. Yeah, that's not it, but it's because they're more of a clear. And the reason for sinuses is actually to make your face lighter. The, the less, hole in your face? Less more bone. More airy? Oh, yeah. Less, no, less bone makes it lighter. So your head's always on like this. Oh. So you have well, less like bone there, on. so it's lighter there. People will say it will also change your voice. Well, it actually does. It changes the way you hear things a little bit too, but it changes your voice a little bit. You're talking about the sinus? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Because of the way it just, the resonance, the vibration. But that's not Sorry. why they're there. They're there to make your head lighter. Your big giant head. So, a sinus rhythm is a normal rhythm. So, an arrhythmia. Abnormal. Abnormal. Is tachycardia an arrhythmia? Yes. Yep. Is bradycardia an arrhythmia? Yeah. Yes. Yep. It's too slow. Yep. It's at normal. Yep. Now, why don't we call it um, like dysrhythmia? I do. Oh, okay. Yep. Same thing. You'll hear me use the terms interchangeably. And then we already talked about how do you pronounce this? Systole. Systole. And diastole. 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 You want to talk about some broken hearts? Mm, not really. It is true that your heartstrings can break. Right? <laughs> yeah, I don't really. No? Not, not to an extent. Mm. More, more likely the problem happened with the valve itself than the actual portic in the mm. But. Can people die from a broken heart? Yeah. No. Yes. Uh, Suicide. That's, that's not a broken heart. That's a whole other subject. You have to jump it off the bridge. It's, it's gravity in the sudden no. stop. I just took a dark turn. My heart is broke. R.R.P. to me. Oh my god, there's a lot of things here. Uh, common arrhythmias. Okay, these two actually go together. Premature beats and palpitations. Um, Normally, a cardiac cycle, we have a contraction and a rest period, but we have that contraction, then we have a rest period, then we have a contraction, then we have a rest period. Let's go back a little bit. Our heart cells, when we're developing in the uterus, our first heart cells were already developed and starting to contract by the time we were about 21 days old. Now, our heart wasn't formed yet, but the cells were there and starting to contract when we were 21 days old. When did those heart cells stop contracting? 18. When we die. When we die. Mm -hmm. Which right, means as all those cells contract and then relax and contract and then relax, we need that little bit of a relaxation period in between. It doesn't seem like much, but I guess not much of a break. Take a day off of work and take a whole day off of work. You want to take a whole break. Exactly, because you take a whole break on Monday, we take a whole break on Tuesday and Wednesday and forever. Mm -hmm. So the heart gets a very short little rest period. So we have contraction rest period, contraction rest period. We have to have that little bit of a rest period. In this case, the premature, the patient will have contraction rest period, contraction rest period, contraction, contraction rest period, uh, contraction rest period, contraction, contraction rest period. Contraction, contraction, rest period, contraction, rest period, contraction. And they'll feel it right here. And they'll say, I feel a thump in my chest. That's how they'll describe it. Oh, okay. We call that that's, a... That's common, though. Palpitation. That's common. Yes. Okay, yeah, that's common. Yes. Yes. We call that a palpitation. So that's why I say the first one and six kind of go together. Anxiety start. I love to say anxiety. I don't know why they include atrial fibrillation. This confuses me a little bit. Um, uh, fibrillation. Is an extreme tachycardia. Well, 
Normally, our heart rate is about 60 to 80, I'm sorry, 60 to 100 beats per minute with an average of about 80 beats per minute. Tachycardia is over 100 beats per minute, resting heart rate. So that doesn't include if you're jogging or something, resting heart rate. Fibrillation is extreme tachycardia, or like 200 beats per minute. How can, how's it, like, what do you, yeah, what do you And completely irregular. Yeah. How so there's no regularity to this. What that means is instead of contracting like this, it's contracting like this. Why is that bad? Well, think about this. It's not directional. When the blood is getting pumped like this, those ventricles are filling up with blood. Now they're pumping out blood. Filling up, pumping out. Filling up, pumping out. If they're going like this, they don't know what they are really they filling, filling up? up? No, they're not filling up. So are they pumping out? Barely. No. I mean, not really either. Not going even one. Just like, at one place, just like this. Tuk, tuk, tuk. Spitting out a little bit. Is spitting out blood from your heart going to be helpful? Uh, no, I'm not. Very much. Not very much. So, I don't want to talk about atrial fibrillation because that's a little bit different. A person can live a long time with atrial fibrillation. The problem is ventricular fibrillation, which you'll notice is not up there. When the ventricles fibrillate like that, what we want to do is stop it. Stop the heart. How do we do that? With no. no. shockers? We shock it. We deliver that, what, 360 joules to the, into the heart? That's if it's going crazy, you saying? Crazy like that. The idea when we shock that patient is to stop the heart. And then, and, so they can and then allow the heart to reset a normal rhythm again. That's what a defibrillator does. A defibrillator is meant to stop the heart. Which means if we're going to shock this person, right before I deliver that shock, what am I going to yell out? Clear! Clear! And I'll probably do something like this as well. Clear! Meaning everybody away. Because sometimes if there's a lot of noise in the background, or people don't speak English, or there's a lot of emotions, and somebody's holding on to a hand or a foot or a toe. Okay? Clear! Now they hear me say clear, they see me do this. And then I shock. What would happen if that person was touching that patient? Um, they would get shot and what would happen to their heart? That would stop. It would stop. They would die right then. So their heart might not start back up again, which means that they could die. See, the idea of that defibrillator is to stop the heart and allow it to restart a normal rhythm again. What if it doesn't restart a normal rhythm? Well, we get the problem. Then they're, then they're dead. But they're going to be dead in a few moments anyway. Because this isn't doing anything for the body. It's not allowing any blood to go anywhere, which means it's just going to stop on its own and the patient will be dead. In what condition is the person when they are fibrillating? fibrillating? Unconscious, typically. Unconscious. Mm -hmm. Oh. So if their heart is stopped, we give CPR, mm -hmm. but we do not shock it. Oh, because shock is meant to start back up again. Shock is meant to stop the heart, not oh. to start it. Do it in emergency rooms all the time. Mm -hmm. Drug shock, drug shock. But that's what that little um, automatic external defibrillator does. They put those leads on. It determines if there's this going on. They'll say shock advised. Then they'll say charging. And then they'll say deliver shock. And you just press that little button, but before you press the button, you say clear, clear, and then you deliver that shock, and then you can start right back to CPR again, and it'll determine if there's still this happening. It's a defibrillator. All right, I'm not.
not going to talk about these other ones. Heart block, I'm not going to get into. That's a little more, that's more for paramedics. You guys don't need to know that as much. We've already sort of talked about these. Oh, there it is. Automatic external defibrillator. Here's the nice thing about an automatic external defibrillator. They have three directions. Direction number one, turn on the machine. Now sometimes, yeah. now sometimes, as soon as you open the machine, it turns on automatically. So that's already taking care of direction number one. But direction number one, turn on the machine. And then the machine speaks to you and tells you what direction number two is. If you can't understand the picture, it tells you. And it says, place pads on patient. Now how do you know where to place the pads? There's a picture here, and there's a picture on the pads. And then it'll say, insert pads in the machine. And there's a little flashing light somewhere here with a plug and you put that in. That's it. Very simple. And it tells you what to do. Easy peasy. Area. Yes. Um, in a patient who is overweight, um, who say, <laughs> say that they, stop, say, say that they um, have a history of um, blood clotting, like say they're getting blood drawn and in that easy there is a blood clot or something. Um, how dangerous are blood clots to people, especially if they are overweight and how do overweight people live with blood clots like circulating through their blood? Okay. Anything that disrupts that waitress from delivering her food to this person mm -hmm. means that person's going to die. Mm -hmm. So if there is a, bl a blood clot in the arteries or the arterioles, then the blood's not going to make it here. Yeah. The person dies. However, most of the time when you hear about blood clots, you hear about blood clots that form in the veins especially the veins in the leg, especially not the superficial veins in the leg, but the deep veins in the leg. Yes. <laughs> deep vein thrombosis. So deep is the opposite of superficial, right? Yeah. So as vessels, the veins are near the surface, they're smaller. As they go towards the inside, they get bigger and they become bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually a larger vein that brings the blood up. So those are larger veins, which means if the blood stops moving, it clots. You know this, if you get a drop of blood and take it out and put it on a piece of paper, put it on a glass side or something, and just watch it, everything starts clumping together, it gets thicker, 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 because everything's clumping together. So when blood stops moving, it starts to clot. So if there's something that's not allowing blood to move correctly up through those veins, it'll start to clump together. Now down there, that's not a huge deal because it's in a vein. So what start clumping together? Blood. The, the, the clotting factors in the blood. Okay. The platelets, mm -hmm. things like that. Like we're into fiber. So in the vein, that's not a really big deal, right? Because blood's going to find another way back. Yeah. Back to the heart. Because all veins go where? Yeah. To the heart. All veins go back to the heart. The problem, however, if part of that clot breaks off, it's like, it's like... It ain't Jesus. <laughs> Or your child. Jesus. <laughs> I don't want you. Sorry. Oh, you're sorry, but you don't complete the test? No, I'm turning the volume down, oh, actually. So, blood clot. so, if that blood clot that's in that deep vein breaks off, it's like throwing a stick into a river. It's just going to go with the flow. And where do veins take the blood? To the heart. To the heart. Which side of the heart? Left. Right. Oh, right. right. Veins take blood oh, yeah. to the right side of the heart. To which chamber? Top or bottom? Top. It doesn't matter. Top, top. of the heart. Top. top right chamber. 
So that top right chamber then pumps blood where? Down. Straight down to the bottom right chamber. That bottom right chamber then pumps blood where? Everywhere. Everywhere. No. Down. Down. Bottom right chamber pumps blood to the lungs. Remember, it needs oxygen. So it goes into this big pulmonary trunk here, some branches off into two pulmonary arteries. And what did I tell you happens when these go into the lungs? They branch off into smaller arteries, mm -hmm. branch off into smaller arteries, branch off into arterials, mm -hmm. branch off into capillaries, mm -hmm. which means the tubes are getting smaller and smaller, progressively smaller. If there's a clot that has traveled with the blood up to the right atrium, it's going to go down the right ventricle, it's going to get pushed up through here, it's going to get pumped over to the lungs. It's a thin and a thin, I'm oh, sorry? Is a thin line of the blood that's being that's being um, traveled to the lungs. Yeah, even the red blood cells have to squeeze through the capillaries. Yeah, they're the smallest vessels. So black people. So if there's a clot going through a part of a clot, eventually it's going to hit one of those vessels that's small. Which means now these red blood cells that are trying to get to this area of the lung can't get there. Mm -hmm. Which means now those red blood cells that are supposed to get oxygen aren't going to get oxygen. Well, if it's a tiny, tiny, tiny clot, you might not realize much of a difference. But what if it's a big clot? What if it clot? What if it blocks a really big artery so that now half the lung doesn't get blood? What if it's a really big clot and it blocks this whole artery here? Now that whole lung doesn't get blood. Does the lung collect? Well, it's not going to be useful. Which means we're only getting half the lung usage, so that we're getting half the amount of oxygen that we need. Which is not good. So of course your heart's gonna try to make up the difference and pump blood faster. That's why I tell paramedic students if a patient has an unexplained tachycardia, they have a fast heart rate, and there's no particular reason for it to be there. It's probably because of a clot in the lungs. What if the clot was so big that it blocked right here? What where? Both of these. Oh, well then the lungs aren't gonna the patient won't be able to breathe. Correct. That's called a saddle emboli. Huh. Patient dies. Oh no. So now, so now I'm the, a little worried. <laughs> that's the concern about clot formation in the blood. Yeah. If it's in the arteries, then we're concerned about blood not going to a particular area. Like the brain, for instance. If there's a clot that ends up blocking or arterial flow into the area of the brain, that means part of the brain doesn't get blood. The person ends up with a cerebrovascular accident, which is also known as Hello, a cerebrovascular accident, which is also known as what? A head trauma. No. Like cerebral cerebral vascular accident. Um is that a brain Stroke. Oh, that's a stroke, cerebrovascular accident. So, I guess like, so the reason I brought it up is because I have a friend, and I've thought about it for a while. So I have a friend, and she when she went to the doctors once, um, she was getting blood drawn, and while they were drawing her blood, they encountered a clot. So they had to like, you know, I guess like fix that situation so they could continue to get the blood. So, like, my question is, if it's that easy to find a clot... How, how do they encounter a clot? That I don't understand. I don't understand either. That's why I brought up the question. But I'm like, if they're, like, encountering a clot I, that I easily... Uh, there's something I'm not... There's something not correct there. Okay. There's, a, there's something lost, something in, lost translation. in translation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I just thought about it a lot. Like, clot key what, what could often right? happen when they're trying to get yeah. blood is they hit the vein, they hit the vein where the valve is. And if you hit the vein where the valve is, well then yes, the blood's not going to come through as well. So you just have to move that, move the needle to fix that problem. Okay. Hmm. Um, if the vein, if a, a needle partially comes out of the vein, if it's part in the vein, part out of the vein, then blood comes out around it. Gotcha. And that I just didn't know if like blood clots, if it, if like blood clots were that like common, I guess that they just like uh, little little clots or so, like something in the cell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, especially in the arm. Yeah, I just assumed it was the arm. I didn't ask anything like that. But I, I would, I would want to, I would want to talk to that doctor. Yeah. Hmm. Not. I don't know. That's just what that's what brought us. Is she a medical idea. professional? Huh? Is she a medical professional? Is she a nurse? No, You're not my friend. friend. No. Okay. No. So she doesn't so, have any medical training. Yeah. Okay. I know that things can get lost in translation. Oh, I, I think just, uh, lost. That's what it. That's why I brought up the whole blood clot. 
question because that just confused me how you could find a blood clot. But there's lots of things that can cause blood to clot. Um, there's hypercoagulable states. If a person is dehydrated, for instance, they're in a hypercoagulable state. A person can have a genetic problem where they're creating too many, just creating too many blood clots. clots. Or not creating enough clot breaker uppers. Because if the body's pretty smart, right? Have you figured this out yet, ladies? Yeah, ladies, yeah, yeah. have you figured this out? The body's pretty smart. So if the body has things that makes clots, it's going to make its own things that breaks up its own clots. Yeah. It's not going to make clots and then just let them sit there. Because we make clots every day, all the time. We have to. We're repairing blood vessels all the time. So if we're taking away old blood vessel walls, we have to make a clot until it's repaired and then put a new blood vessel wall. So you have to break up the clot. So people can be defect deficient in those factors that cause clots to break up. We'll see it later on called Birchhouse Triad. Uh, these things that increase likelihood of clot formation. But this is also why when she delivers that baby, we don't let her leave the hospital without checking her ankles. We're checking to see if there's any pain or tenderness or what redness or swelling, anything that could indicate that the clot is formed. Prolonged inactivity. Something called disseminated intravascular coagulation. The patient has combined clotting and bleeding at the same time. Hmm. That sounds scary. It is scary. It's a scary. <laughs> yes, that's the reason. It's the scariest thing ever. Um, it can happen as a result of complications of the pregnancy. It can happen in cancer patients. It can happen in burn victims. People like from a, in a house fire, and I mean like they were, you know, like on fire, not like they burnt their finger with a match. It can happen in envenomation. What's envenomation? Uh, envenomation. In the veins. Envenomation, not envenomation. Envenomation. Venom. Venom. Where do we get venom? What? Snakes. Some snakes. That's why they call those snakes venomous snakes, because they inject venom. Spiders, evil spiders, all spiders have venom. What? All Even spiders daddy have venom. Even like garden spiders. Even garden spiders, especially garden spiders. Aren't, some aren't daddy Most long legs? Them, but not like around here, but there are some that have venom. Aren't daddy long legs supposed to be like one of the most venomous spiders, but their mouth is too small to bite? That is an old wives' tale. Oh, okay. Uh, their mouth parts do puncture human skin and they can. Oh, good. But their venom is not strong at all. It's okay. about average for a So you'd have like a normal rela reaction? Yep. No. It's about average for a spider. But that's, yeah, it's an old wives' tale. That was powerful, but it can't puncture human skin. Just like the uh, if you step on a daddy long like it rains? No, that's true, actually. Well, Scientifically. Uh, stop. Scientifically proven. <laughs> Unpleasant sensation of rapid beat of the heart, that's that palpitation. Restoration of a normal heart rhythm by electric shock, we call that Cardioversion. Cardioversion. And I hate this one. I hate this definition. This sucks. This is a sucky definition. Uncontrolled. Uncontrolled grilling the heart muscle. That just makes it sound like the heart muscle going. Yeah. But that's not what's happening at all. It's a fibrillation. What's happening is the contractions are happening so quickly and without any regularity that it appears that the heart is quivering. Oh, I can picture that, like the heart, like kind of like. Yes, because it's doing this so quickly. Mm -hmm. But it's not quivering, it's Being rapidly contracting. contracting and relax and not, not relaxing enough in no particular uh, rhythm. That's the real definition of it. This just makes it sound like any quivering heart. It's, I, don't, I hate that definition, it's stupid. You want it to sound more scary. I want, I want it to be scared. People should be scared of this. Because if a person has ventricular fibrillation, they're going to die in the next few moments. Mm -hmm. Unless we stop that heart. Mm -hmm. 
and then this cup. <laughs> now we're not going to talk about those. Okay. Here's those heart valves. You'll notice there's a heart valve here. That's the tricuspid between the right atrium and right, right ventricle. You'll notice there's a heart valve here. That's the bicuspid, also there's the mitral valve between the left atrium and left ventricle. You'll notice there's a valve here in the pulmonary trunk. So that blood does not go backwards into that right ventricle. That is called a semilunar valve, and what we call that the pulmonary valve. Or I think they use the whole name, pulmonary semilunar valve, which is, you don't have to put it up. It's either a semilunar valve, or specifically it's the pulmonary valve. The blood to go this way, if it tries to go backwards, they shut. And the other valve is right here, the aortic valve, that stops blood from coming backwards into the left ventricle. Valve, 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 valve. So what's the job of a valve? The job of a valve is to let blood come through and then what? Close. Snap shut. Blood comes through and then snap shut. Blood comes through and then snap, snap shut. What if that valve is stuck? Well, a murmur. It'll create a murmur. The blood's going to flow backwards. Blood's going to flow backwards. If it's stuck, we call it stenosis. Stuckness. What's incompetent? And don't say you and your job. What's <laughs> incompetent? It's just not beating it right. Like it's not doing its job correctly. So an incompetent valve would look like this. Gotcha. Which is different than a stuck valve. Yeah. But would we still hear, would we still have backflow? Yeah. So would we still hear a murmur? Yeah. Yes. So in either case, we can still hear a type of a murmur. Incompetent. Who? Who? When that valve is <laughs> artificial heart valves. We can use plastic. Or we can use real tissue. We can use pig. Pig? Yeah. The skin? Yeah, the skin's not the Isn't no, the tissue closest? Because it's close. Because it's, it's close similar enough. to... Yeah, close um, enough. Sure. Why not? Still we can even skin. use horse. No, I'm cool with the horse. I'll take the pig. I was not a horse. I'll take the pig. I want the horse. I'll take that pig before. She called horses. She's really good at it. <laughs> All right, you know why I'm good at it? In elementary school, <laughs> here we go. There is this because there is this girl. She's real cool. 